welcome to Tabletop Tommy's episode 20. I'm Johnny. And I'm Phil. And I'm Brad. Today, we're being joined by a very special guest, as it is episode 20. We have the host of Cast Dice. He's also the host of the Warlord Games official podcast. He is also one of the members of the Bolt Action Alliance team and also host of the Ghost Army podcast. He is Brad. Many of you will be very familiar with his voice. Welcome to the show, Brad. Man, it is a real pleasure to be on. I am a longtime listener of your show, longtime listener, first time caller. It is a <laughs> pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, every time people do an intro, I realize I've probably done too many podcasts in the past. But uh, yeah, so can you do too many podcasts? Is there such a thing? Well, like every other third white man on the planet, I have a podcast and I have several. <laughs> so, you know, apparently I have lots of opinions. Fortunately, you're not here to talk to us about podcasts. So are you? I, what we'd really like to hear about is the Bolt Action Alliance mission pack that's just been released. But before that, what I would really like to know is about your sort of history in gaming. Have you been wargaming for a long time? Uh, the short answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> I am a very old person to the point where a lot of uh, a lot of folks refer to me as Old Man Morin, and that was my moniker for many years on a variety <laughs> of podcasts. I'm almost 50, and I know some of you say, well, that's not that old, but I basically learned to read reading game books and comic books. So okay. I've been playing games since literally grade one. Mm -hmm. um, I was playing Battletech, Car Wars, uh, original Dungeons and Dragons way back when, and I basically learned to read by playing those games. Um, at some point in middle school, this thing called Warhammer 40,000 came out. And so I jumped mm. on Rogue Trader about a year after it came out and mm. played that almost religiously for a very long time to the point where <laughs> I used to work for Games Workshop and corporate in the US. That's how I got to know John Stollard, who runs Warlord. Um, he was my boss. Mm -hmm. And that's how I ended up being the host of the Warlord cast, uh, long story short. And then I now live in Australia. And when Bolt Action came out, I mean, it was a game put out by my favorite game author, Rick Priestley, mm -hmm. and Alessio, who's also another one of my favorite game developers. So there, there was nothing I wasn't going to love about that and uh, jumped in both feet. And I've been podcasting and playing Bolt Action and creating Bolt Action content since. Uh, I'm a huge fan and uh, I play all sorts of games. And if you've ever listened to an episode of Cast Dice, you know that I have attention deficit disorder and I cannot, <laughs> and I'm not actually kidding. I am actually an adult with attention deficit disorder mm -hmm. who spends way too much time thinking and talking about games of all varieties. But Bolt Action is by far my favorite. Oh, really? That was going to be my next question. Because um, obviously it is our favorite game, hence why the entire podcast is about Bolt Action. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what other systems are you enjoying at the minute? Oh, that is a good question. Um, look, Phil, I know you're not going to make any connections here, but mm -hmm. I love 7TV. The 7TV yep. new revised book mm -hmm. has just come out from the Kickstarter with all of the gubbins in the box, and I just got it last Thursday. Fantastic. I'm very excited about that game. Yeah. It's super fun. Mine arrived at the weekend. I've, I've looked through it, but I haven't, haven't had a chance yet to properly dig into it. But very excited by that. Yeah, man. Any game where I can take all of my favorite intellectual properties from the 70s to 80s and beyond and put them on the tabletop. I literally played a game with G.I. Joe versus Cobra. I've mm. played <laughs> Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles versus the aliens from the TV series V. I mean, you can put Ghostbusters <laughs> teaming up with Michael Knight from Knight Rider against um, like pff, the bad guys from He-Man. Like if yeah. <laughs> anything's possible, it is amazing. I love that game. Uh, highly recommend. Uh, I've also been playing the crud out of Marvel Crisis Protocol. Mm -hmm. As I said, I grew up playing or sorry, reading comic books mm -hmm. and uh, love Marvel. So I've been playing a lot of that, mainly painting the, the comic characters that I loved reading about as kids. With Bolt Action, you, you're painting an army. And I mm. feel like individual model painting and army painting are slightly different but related skills. Yeah, 100%, and yeah. I, yeah, I, I love painting armies, but mm. to be able to take the time and to really spend the, like a week on a model and crank out a hero that I'm so, you know, you feel connected with after reading their stories for years, it's just, it's just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So, um, yep, I've been enjoying that. 
And Bot War uh, in any game out of Australia, which is like 80s giant robot fighting <laughs> game. So much fun. It's nice not to paint green for a bit as well, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Oh my God, man. That's usually the reason if I ever paint something that isn't bold action, it'll usually be something either sci-fi or fantasy for that exact reason. So I can go into those paints that are otherwise just going to dry up by the time I get to them, like my blues. Yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. I just had to buy more yellow the other day because I was like, I just don't have any yellow. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. But jumping back to bold action. Yes, sir. The bold action alliance. So that's something that I think a lot of bolt action players are very familiar with. Yeah. But I personally, I'm not too familiar with the history of the bolt action line. So exactly what it is, other than the fact that it's got some good resources available. So what is the sort of the history of the bolt action lines? The galaxy far, far away, <laughs> a long time ago, uh, there was a podcast out of the United States when bolt action first came out uh, called bolt action radio. Or as Dano on that show would say, the (laughs) bar. And Bolt Action Radio was sort of the gold standard. It was part of the WWPD network um, at the time of podcasts. And they had a web page. And as part of that, um, they put out Bolt Action related articles every, you know, every couple of days or Mm -hmm. twice a week or once a week. And um, there would be constant episodes. I think they were monthly back then of Bolt Action Radio. And they had an after hours if you, you know, had a subscription service with WWPD. And so they would put out maybe two episodes a month or maybe even more regularly. Anyway, we were fans. I was playing Bolt Action here. I got it as soon as it came out from War and Peace Games, the local distributor. Mm -hmm. And so I was playing with uh, my friends who I had been playing, you know, Warhammer Fantasy with, Warhammer 40K with, um, particularly Dave of War and uh, the Mouth of Madness, Lachlan. And we got really into it. And I talked to those guys into starting a podcast uh, because I really wanted to talk about Bolt Action because I was on the Dwellers Below Fantasy podcast. But I really want to talk about that. So I roped those guys in and we quickly got Warlord Tobu online uh, as our sort of resident painting expert. <laughs> and then the LRDG podcast was born. And shortly thereafter, the guys in Bolt Action Radio heard us. We heard them. We'd been talking back and forth for a little bit. And um, one drunken New Year's, Judson and I um, were Skype calling across the planet, Judson in New York and me here. And mm-hmm. over one too many tasty beverages, the, the, we were merged. And <laughs> eventually that became boltaction.net. And we joined their network. Embarrassingly, we had their entire network kicked off of iTunes multiple times because of uh, risky content, but we eventually (laughs) got there. But the LRDG eventually got new members, those in different cities, and that then split off to create the Ghost Army podcast. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, there were a bunch of different podcasts all on one network, and we were all putting out different articles on WWPD on the website, none of which is up anymore, unfortunately. But When WWPD went under, when the owner eventually stopped paying for it, we took on the moniker of Bolt Action Alliance. Right. Now, BoltAction.net was famous for a couple of things uh, at the end of version one, beginning of version two, mainly for putting out this thing called the .NET format, Mm -hmm. um, which was a set of rules or changes to the rules of Bolt Action that would make the game more playable. For example, LMGs were cheaper. Is this in V1 rule set or is this going into V2? This is V1. This was a set of rule changes that was put together largely by Judson and Craig Baxter, Seabax, and the rest of us contributed to that. Mm -hmm. And then that was sort of universally taken on by a lot of events in the UK and the US and across Australia. Some people liked it, some people didn't. As ever. (laughs) Yeah, of course. Uh, But they seem to be largely accepted. And a lot of those rules made themselves into version two. Mm -hmm. So clearly, you know, some of those rules that those guys came up with resonated with the community. Mm. I am embarrassed to say when I'm telling this part of the story that Mm -hmm. I'm a rules as written guy. Mm -hmm. I don't like changing rules much at all, if Mm -hmm. ever. Um, And I really didn't want to do that. 
And I talked to the guys and I said, I would really like to give because people were getting tired of playing the same thing and running into the same problems, which is why the .NET format existed anyway. Mm -hmm. But my sort of take on that was, well, why don't we give people different ways to play? And that led to the creation of the 2016 Bolt Action Alliance, or at that point, Bolt Action .NET Mission Pack, mm -hmm. okay. um, which had favorites like Heartbreak Ridge, Kitty Hawk Down. I can't even think of all the names of the missions now. Yeah, classic missions. They still make their way into tournaments now. Yeah, yeah. Outbreak Ridge uh -huh. is one we see a lot in the UK tournament scene. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm humbled that you know people still enjoy it. So, so eventually, Bolt Action Alliance became its own thing, and a lot of the members uh, had had left at that point. The network went down. We became our own entity, and it kind of turned into what it is now which is um, a collection of passionate hobbyists, most of whom still play bolt action on the side, but most of whom it isn't their main game at the moment. Yeah. Okay. I'm hoping that, and this is just my personal speculation, I'm hoping that when we get to perhaps version three, mm -hmm. um, we'll see some of these guys back. But I know, for example, you know, Brian Cook, author of the Budapest book, who's also part of the Bolt Action Alliance, Patchamus Prime. Patch is talking about coming out for CanCon to play this year. I know Brian's been painting more Soviets. Casey and Seamus um, are US contingents. They're actively painting stuff and playing games as well. And we are the cast of the Ghost Army podcast as a whole. So I'm hoping that eventually uh, we will see a more active return of the Bolt Action Alliance. Yeah. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry, that went a little bit off. Very much so. No, that was <laughs> yeah, yeah, completely was brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more of a loose collaboration rather than a very strict formal agreement, is what it sounds like. It is. Um, we are a defunct podcast, or not defunct. We are on hiatus. We will be back. Mm -hmm. um, we do put out episodes from time yep. to time. But we are also a Facebook uh, messenger group mm -hmm. that talks literally constantly, 24 <laughs> hours a day, because we have members who you know, work hours that have them up earlier, going to bed late, mm. plus people on the other side of the planet, mm -hmm. there is that is a chat that never ends. And so I talk to those guys constantly and uh, they are some of my best friends. And um, over the years, you know, we support each other through these projects. Um, and so when the 2016 mission pack came out, we said we would like feedback and we put these missions out individually and we got feedback from the community as they were taken up across the world. And we collected that feedback. And then Brian Cook and I went back. I mean, Anthony was a member of the group at that point as well. Um, and we went back and we constantly revised and put out the 2016 pack. I took on feedback during, I collected all that feedback. And then during Melbourne's first significant lockdown in 2020, I had a lot of requests of, hey, what happened to that mission pack? I can't find it um, because it had been taken down offline um, because our, our hosting disappeared yeah. and it was being shared. Um, but some of the missions that were being shared were being shared by people who had changed it for their own events. And that's fine. We've always said that if you want to change a mission, please let us know because you know it might lead to us changing it ourselves if it's a good change. Um, and so people were coming to me with questions or coming to the Alliance with questions about missions. And we would say, First of all, either A, we didn't write that mission, mm -hmm. or B, <laughs> that's not the mission we wrote. Yeah. And so we we took the feedback that we did have, which was a significant folder of feedback, um, and then used it to put out the 2020 pack. Now, Anthony, as I said, wasn't part of the Bolt Action Alliance anymore. So we did remove his mission uh, from the original six, and I wrote a replacement mission. And in doing so, I found notes for a number of other missions. Mm -hmm. And I got to talking with a couple of tournament organizers and friends who played bolt action. And a couple of them had mentioned, hey, are you going to do another one of these? And with the encouragement of the Bolt Action Alliance crew, I started on the second pack, which was supposed to come out in 2022. But because of the way that we painstakingly play test these things and look for feedback, uh, it actually didn't come out till yeah. <laughs> just now. Ta-da! Yeah, that was going to be one of my next questions, actually, about how long it takes, because we've actually got in the vault an, an episode of one mission that we're putting out for people to try for the exact same reason as you mm -hmm. said earlier. People might be getting a bit bored of playing the same old missions. 
and we found sort of the time we've spent play testing just one mission mm-hmm. and then formatting it, making sure it's all we haven't put anything silly in the rules pack was quite a significant investment. But mm-hmm. I imagine how many missions are in the new pack and just how long did it take? Well, it took almost three years. Uh two yeah. two years <laughs> and three quarters. And it is nine missions. Mm. Yeah. And every single one of those missions, bar one, has been played either extensively behind closed doors and or has been played in multiple events. And has we have actively sought out player feedback after both the casual games and from tournament organizers or, I mean, for example, several of these missions were played at CanCon last year, Australia's largest bolt action event. Um, And so we got feedback from the TOs and from several players on how we could improve. And of course, we use that uh, feedback as well. And again, almost all of them had been played rigorously uh, by uh, the best way to test these things is at events, be it competitive, be it casual, because people are bringing a variety of armies and they're bringing, you know, they're coming at it wanting different things you know different armies operate differently on the table and it's one thing for me to play you know a couple of the different armies that i have in my collection and my friends to bring the armies from their Mm -hmm. collection but if you want to really kick the tires so to speak you really need Mm -hmm. to get people who think completely differently than you do which is one of the reasons why when i write these missions i often send them to friends in the uk um friends in the u.s Tabletop CP, the YouTube channel, our good buddy Travis loves to play our missions online. And so, I mean, a lot of people will have seen some of these missions already played months, if not years ago, um, because they were part of the the playtest process. Um, And we really did want to create a mission pack. And I guess I never finished my thought before that was fair and fun, where you had missions that could be or were usually largely symmetrical. So both players walked into the game with the same standing as far as one person isn't being disadvantaged over another. Yeah, And I know that there's a couple of choices that we made with this pack that a couple of people have already questioned that were intentional design philosophies because we really did try to make things as fair and fun for both players, Mm -hmm. be it in a competitive or a casual environment. These missions can be enjoyed by anyone. And that's their point. Brilliant. I was going to ask about that, Brad. What's the thought process behind how the missions have been designed with regards to making them fair? Like you said, being able to, you know, walk into the game from, from either side of the table on an equal footing versus actually we're going to lean in towards attack and defender scenarios and there's there's very much different conditions um, depending on if you're attack or defender and so on. That's an excellent question. Well, the pack is written, this pack. So the original pack was six missions and it the 2020 pack was six missions. The 2023 pack, this one that has just come out, has the same six, they're different missions, but the same philosophy holds for the core six missions. And if you look at the pack itself, it's like a a burgundy red color on the background and on the header for those six missions. And those are designed to be symmetrical and fair. Now, I will get into the attacker defender conundrum in a second, because that's actually been the big sticking point for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. The Well, not for a lot, for a couple of people who's met who have messaged, I should say. Mm -hmm. The other three of the nine are meant to be fun. And they're meant to, they are less symmetrical. They are less fair. So one of the missions in the original pack that was very controversial, the controversial mission was Kitty Hawk Down. Mm. It was controversial because you never knew quite where it was going to land. It always landed on the center line. So it was fair for both players. Mm. But if someone had moved in a certain way, it is either going to hit them and really you know, wreck a couple of their units, <laughs> or they would have yeah, been yeah. like bet that it would land somewhere else, and then they were disadvantaged, and then they had to get to it. And so people love or hate that mission. Mm-hmm. Um, so we use the feedback from that and from Heartbreak Ridge to create for this pack, Supply Drop, which is a combination of the two. Um, supply Drop is very similar to what you had in Kitty Hawk Down, two forces moving forward, coming at each other. And then at the beginning of turn four, something drops out of the sky. 
except in this case, it's care packages, which are the objectives. One drops in the middle, and then you roll an order dice and 3d6. And the order dice has an arrow at the top. All order dice have it. A lot of people don't realize, but there is an arrow on the top of every single one of those order dice in your order dice bag. (laughs) And you roll that and you add up the 3d6, add nine, and you put a, an objective that far from the center objective. So now you have two on the board, but one might be, well, one was definitely going to be kind of deep in one player's half. Well, how do we make that fair? Well, to be symmetrical, we'll just drop it another one exactly the same distance in the opposite direction. So with that, it's fair for both. Yeah, exactly. Well, one of the non-symmetrical missions, Pennies from Heaven, is at the start of turn three, again, you have one drop in the middle, but then four more drop in random spots. That isn't fair. You know, someone may have them all land on their side. (laughs) That would (laughs) not be a mission that I would recommend for hardcore competition play. Supply drop, on the other hand, has been played in four events, Mm. big events now, competitive events, and the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. That is a mission designed for competitive play, whereas Pennies from Heaven is not. And I have had some people ask, Mm. what's up with penises from heaven? (laughs) (laughs) the name is a nod um i spent a lot of time living in new orleans and new orleans is home of the higgins boat that's right yeah. which were the amphibious landing craft of on Mm d-day and a big uh, music star of new orleans was louis prima and his song pennies from heaven and i was reading an account of an american gi who was talking about um, being stuck in the trenches and cheering himself up by singing pennies from heaven and i just went Yep, that tracks. So that's a nod to the city of New Orleans, Higgins boats, and um, you know the music mm. that soldiers were listening Brilliant. to at the time. Nice. Yeah, we've played Supply Drop. We have, that's, as you say, it is a, a very fair mission. The I think the pennies from heaven because it it starts turn three. I think you drop yeah. the objectives. It is, yep. and so you've probably misdeployed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> depending on where they land. And so I think that's probably the reason why it is one of the fun ones. I actually think if you did those objectives before the game started randomly like that, mm-hmm. there is potential for it to still be quite a fair mission there. So um, already I'm thinking of ways to modify <laughs> yeah. some of your missions. We'll start that game with telephone early. Yeah, well, that's the thing, right? It, these missions were meant to be played. They're meant to be played with. We want to give the community tools um, that they can use to play games. You don't like something? That's okay. Change it. Yeah. Again, going back to why this happened, I wanted to give people a way to play bolt action in in a different and enjoyable way that mixed it up for them so they didn't have to change how many points half tracks cost. So Mm -hmm. they didn't have to, you know, um, worry about, you know, how many pins a medium machine gun Mm -hmm. did. They can just get down, play the game that we know and love on the tabletop and play it in a different way and have fun with it. Brilliant. Fantastic. Yeah. Just going to jump back, Brad, to the playtesting side of things, because the a couple of the missions were released earlier on this year, weren't they? Yeah. In a sort of like a, you know, demo or, um, you know, kind of preview form. Because we, I ran an event in my local club back in March, and we used Supply Drop in that event, which is when Johnny said earlier that we, we'd played it before. Mm-hmm. Jump to Action was the other one that we I've played before at the club, but not in the event. Was that part of the feedback process as well? Because I think they, they were put out on Facebook, weren't they? Am I right in saying that? Uh, most of the missions in the pack were put out after the event that they were released at. I run okay. a few events in Melbourne, uh, quite a few actually. And so each one of these um, has been played in an event of some kind with the exception of Rolling Thunder. Mm. Some of them have changed names. Some of them have changed significantly since their initial release but after the events where they took place i would release the missions jump to action was literally named after the event that it debuted in jump to action shifting objectives was originally called something else Mm -hmm. and was different but it again um, was released on facebook supply drop thin red line um, window of opportunity all of these missions were originally put out um, through the Cast Dice Facebook page, and in some cases, the Bolt Action Alliance Facebook page, so that they could be enjoyed by the community. Um, some of them never made it out of uh, initial playtesting, and they were taken back and scrapped. 
um, the mission that shifting objectives became Mm -hmm. um, was dismantled and redone again because of feedback. So that has always been part of the process is releasing it to the community in bits and pieces. But every time we did that, it was very clear that this is a beta version of the mission. Please send us your feedback. We want it. Um, And it would either go to the Cast Eyes Facebook page or the Bolt Action Alliance Facebook page. And then we would, I would collect that feedback Mm -hmm. and then use it when tinkering with um, before final edits. Now, I did have a, a very supportive group of local friends, uh, many of whom uh, I can say like Dave Hunsdale and Jonathan and Lee and uh, countless others um, who we were scheduled to play one game. And then the night before or the morning of of the game we were supposed to play, I would uh, actually, I have a bolt action Alliance (laughs) mission problem. Do you mind if we play this? Uh, And then I'd pick their brains for feedback afterward. There was a lot of that involved as well. But without the community, as I said before, the way different people look at things <laughs> and interpret them, I, I never would have had half of the success with these missions that, than we have had over the years. So w- this is truly a community effort. And we, do, we really do listen to the feedback that everyone has sent our way. So if you do have any feedback about it, any of these missions, please go to the Cast Dice Facebook page or the Bolt Action Alliance Facebook page and ask for Brad. <laughs> Brilliant. Speaking about the success, Brad, some of the missions from the previous pack, like Nuts and Heartbreak Ridge, are mm-hmm. being seen in major you know, international and national competitive events as part of the regular pack which must be incredibly rewarding for yourself and the rest of the guys who put the missions together. A hundred percent. We never thought it would be, they, they would be as popular as they have been. Uh, It's incredibly humbling and it's been, you know, the, the most rewarding part of this has been um, being able to uh, hear from people around the world playing these games. Uh, I went to God, uh, I've been to a couple events over the years where I've shown up and, um, started to set up for a game and um, been handed the mission and gone, ah, I know this mission. I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. uh, and my opponent, you know, we will start playing and then the TO will come over and start asking me questions about it. And my opponent will be like, wait, wait, why is he asking you questions? And I was like, cause I wrote the mission. It's like, wait, I, I know this mission. And I was like, mm, awkward. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I, I imagine that makes a difficult game though, because there's always some slight amendment. And if you go in gung ho, thinking you know it off by heart, and someone's changed something, I imagine that always catches you off. Yes, and I do have, as I mentioned before, the attention deficit disorder. So in my mind, nuts and heartbreak ridge. I'll be completely honest. If you asked me to to tell you about those missions right now, mm-hmm. I would mix them. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, hundred percent. Well, this is what I always say when people say you should ask the author what why they wrote the rule the way they did. And I always think if they haven't played it for five years, they'll have no idea why they did it because yeah. I can't remember what I wrote last week, basically. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, the mission that I know the best in this, actually the two I know best right at this moment are Pincer Movement and The Thin Red Line because I was rewriting those and rewriting those and rewriting those and replaying those up until um, when this pack went off for publication um, in July. Yeah, Pincer's interesting because it's Attacker Defender. There's the three objectives in the middle, but the only difference that I could spot was the Defender sets up in the middle of their table edge and the Attacker deploys in the corners of their table edge. Correct. But there's not a prep difference, so we're not, we haven't got that disadvantage for the defender being prepped, Mm -hmm. and the reserves are the same for both sides. So it's very much just, do you want to set up in the middle, or do you want to set up on the outsides, isn't it? That's entirely right. Or am I missing something? Um, I, in order to answer that question, I think I need to actually get into the, there's a couple of things that have been quote unquote controversial decisions with this pack. Mm-hmm. Unlike the last one, I think this one really had a couple of things that had people asking, particularly more at the competitive end. Um, and the two that they that I've heard repeatedly because these missions were handed out to the Moab players weeks ago, uh, and they've been messaging me with questions in preparation of one of Mel, sorry, one of Australia's larger bolt action events. I think they have 42 players this year. Nice. Um, and it's coming up in a couple of weeks. So they've been playing mm-hmm. preparatory 
games to to be ready because you know speaking of humbling a moab is an event that i respect and love and i used to play at religiously um before i stopped sort of traveling out to do a lot of interstate travel and they're taking five the five missions for moab this year are from the 2023 pack wow and so you know that <laughs> it's very humbling uh, and they they committed to that before they'd read the pack. okay <laughs> it's a lot of confidence in you there well, it, no pressure at all. I didn't want to screw it up. Yeah. But, you know, answering all the questions that have come in has been rewarding in that, oh, yeah, it's in there. Oh, yeah, I remember why that's there. Oh, yes, that's right. Mm-hmm. Got it. Because we did turn this in for publication months ago. And then, we, you know, now is when it's coming out. And so I did have to scratch my head and think, hey, how did that go again? Yeah. Was one of the changes that was questioned the order dice in the bag on turn one decisions. I noticed in a lot of the missions on turn one, whereas normally you just put an order dice for every unit, you've changed it slightly. And on turn one in a lot of these missions, you only put an order die in the bag for each unit on the table. Okay. And not for the reserves. Was that one of the questions that's been asked already? No, it is not. Interesting. Because that's one of the things I noticed. And I, I would like to ask you the reason for that change there. That is a good question. So, mm-hmm. so none of these missions, if you look carefully, have the players putting the, you know, you roll to see who's going like on which side of the board. You roll to get everything going. And then you, you know, you figure out your half, your force that's going to go on the table, blah, 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 blah. Then you put in the dice for those bag, you know, those units in the bag and you pull them out to deploy the units. None of these missions have that because. I find that to be incredibly tedious and time consuming. And these missions were written for competitive play in mind. Now, they can be played casually. I don't play competitively anymore. I I refuse to. Um, I've had a couple of bad experiences. It doesn't mean that I don't enjoy playing in events. I love event play. But one of my biggest pet peeves is when you play in an event and you can't get past the third turn because there's not enough time and the missions slow things down. So that picking order dice and going back and forth business does not exist in this pack. Likewise, if you get rid of the order dice in turn one for the order dice not in play for that turn, it speeds up the mission. And that was the point. Now, that was controversial. I wasn't asked about that weirdly, but that was something that we talked about behind closed doors a lot. And the reason we did that is if you are putting things down, you know, if you're half of your army's going down on the table, it's not changing the ratio of dice. It's just, you know, as in, you know, you may have more dice than I do. That isn't going to change. Hmm. Um, it's just going to slow down the game. Now, I understand, you know, some people may not want to put all the units on the board. Again, this comes down to how players approach the mission. Do you have to play that way if you want to change it in a, in a mission or a TO wants to get rid of that line? Please go ahead. But the goal for a lot of the events that I've been running is to get players through at least five full turns. And in every one of the uh, events I run, at the end of each round, there are bonus points you can accrue, five bonus points. One of them is you know destroying your opponent's most expensive unit, you know getting their lieutenant, having your lieutenant survive, blah, blah, blah. Those change. But the one that I'm passionate is always in there is, did you and your opponent finish five full turns? <laughs> if you did, both of you get a bonus point. Nice. It rewards not necessarily fast play, but play to a point in the game where you can see a clear winner. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There is nothing worse than you setting up, playing a game, and you're just getting into the guts of it. Tur- game ends. And no one really has a handle on it. And somebody wins sort of half-assedly because they have a couple of units on an objective and their opponents haven't gotten there yet. It just feels bad. And the point of this is to be fun and to eliminate the feel-bads. Another controversial choice was something you mentioned earlier, which is the attacker defender. And this was something that I had questioned by several of the Moab players. Almost all the missions have attacker defender. And people are asking, well, why? Well, I'm an Italian player. Amongst many other things. <laughs> For your sins. Uh, yeah. Well, I have I have what? I have over 10 painted bolt action armies. Italians are one of them. Um, I play in, in a, uh, an Italian Sahariana, Auto Sahariana Force, which is the Italian version of the LRDG. 
Yeah. Now, it feels really bad to line up against an Italian player and to see their face when they're like, oh, I don't get it again. <laughs> the Italians are already getting beaten up by their national rules. They don't mm-hmm. need to have another negative. <laughs> so by including attacker defender in there, they're automatically have the chance of getting their rule. And it's not just the Italians. The attacker defender does factor in with several things. So the it's an old school Warhammer 40K philosophy. Um, because honestly, friends, and I know some people scoff the second you say 40K, but if you really consider like third, fourth ed 40K, the same people <laughs> designed that, yep. that designed bolt action. And they are very similar. Exactly. Well, that's why a lot of the bolt action players have come from 40K, isn't it? Because this is, I sort of cut my teeth on third edition 40K. There you go. And then it drifted into a game that I didn't really enjoy anymore because it got more and more complex. You start to have weird sort of psychic effects and cards and objective points and all. They added like fortifications. It all got a bit too much. Mm-hmm. And so Bolt Action was brilliant because it was like resetting back to third edition 40K. Nice and simple. You've got a rifle. I've got a rifle. We've got a few little quirky rules that make our nations unique. But ultimately, I actually have the mental capacity to hold everybody's rules in my head at the same time Amen. without having to constantly check a book. Entirely, brother. Preach, preach, <laughs> testify. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you look at a lot of those missions, particularly the tournament missions for third, fourth ed, they often said, you know, defender, you roll, you roll off, attacker, defender, whoever it is can choose. Defender chooses they, their side of the board. And then they hold that by putting down either a unit or their units. And again, this is a, an intentional mechanic to speed up the game yeah, and to get you into the playing of the game. Now, I have been told by several people that they think that it disadvantages the defender to put their units down first. Well, in all of those missions, you choose as defender how many units up to half yeah. that you're putting down or up to the limit. So you're choosing how many units you're putting down. So you, you can really control what you're putting down up to the point that the mission allows you. But then getting to what you said, you choose the table side. Mm. That is a massive advantage with a lot of armies being able to, you know, systematically really look at and say, okay, what does my army have? What does their army have? And then quickly saying, okay, this side advantages me. And then the other player, their advantage is they get to see where you are. And that way it's fair. And as someone who's played all of these missions, I literally can't tell you how many times (laughs) they really like, I I really believe that that works. And I have been playing as the attacker and the defender a lot. And I think that the defender really does have a strong advantage and that they get to pick where they set up. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the attacker then gets the advantage and that they see where the defenders are committed. Yeah. And it does very much depend on your play style because from my perspective, the way I tend to play, I much prefer to see where you're going first. I like to sort of react mm-hmm. to you, but there are players I know who are very much the opposite where they very much like to set. They like to take the initiative and sort of set the game in motion themselves. And so for them, getting to choose the sides is a big thing. Exactly. And it is one we do here as well. We do it the Welsh Open Every year, Mark always sets here, and actually that one's quite unique because the table has a unique mission to it. Mm-hmm. And we've so we've done sort of Kitty Hawk down and missions like that where you normally wouldn't see them in a tournament, but because the mission is specific to the table, it's allowed that to your Mark there to sort of make sure that the mission will be fair, even if it's not a perfectly balanced mission on every single table. Exactly. I guess the the other big controversial point here is I don't have preliminary bombardment in any of these missions. I did notice that, yeah. The (laughs) only one that's in there is Rolling Thunder, which is designed around preliminary bombardment. Mm -hmm. But preliminary bombardment has been a bit of a a feel-badsy for a lot of people for a long time because if you get hit and your opponent doesn't get hit, Mm -hmm. it feels bad. 100%. And Absolutely. Yeah, I think back to the second time I played at Moab. Um, we were playing, sorry, at uh, CanCon, um, I was playing my Japanese versus Brian Cook and his Australians. Preliminary bombardment came in and 
it was the craziest uh, series of <laughs> dice rolls I'd ever seen. Literally more than half of my army was destroyed, like blown off the table, did not exist. It was not pins destroyed and everything else had like one pin. And I just went, well, mm. I guess that's the game. Yeah. And he rolled me up in a couple of turns because mm. you know, I lost, I think, three of my units, my tank. Um, it, I just got totally wiped out. And that isn't why I've gotten rid of Plenary Barb in that one experience. <laughs> but I do remember that. And as a TO, I watch people do this. And a lot of TOs handle this by saying, roll for preliminary bombardment once for the table. Yeah. And yeah. if it hits, it hits both people. If it doesn't, it doesn't hit both people because that's fair. And rather than even putting that in, I went, well, you want preliminary bombardment? Cool. No problems. Play Rolling Thunder. Yeah. Where it's built into the mission parameters and it elaborates on it. And you can be additionally pinned depending on how far into that barrage you want to deploy. Mm. And so there's tactics to that mission built in that lean into that mechanic. But otherwise, I personally find it to be a frustrating mechanic that leads to feel bads that also takes up a lot of time and slows things down. Yeah. And again, the philosophy of these missions is to get rid of anything that will keep the guts of the game from getting onto that tabletop. I guess the other, and that leans into another big philosophy of these missions in all of the missions that I write, which is I always am trying to encourage players to move. Yep. I like to have objectives. There are There is no kill point mission in this pack, but two of the missions have bonuses, uh, victory points for killing a certain number of opponent's units on top of the objectives that exist on the tabletop. I am encouraging players, you know, to get out of their deployment zone, get onto those objectives for window of opportunity to get into their opponent's deployment zone and still capture objectives that are around. Yeah. And that's really nice because that is one of the valid strategies when for every mission is if you play it as kill points, if they've got nothing left, you're going to win either way. No matter what the objective was, <laughs> if you're the only one left on the table, You've won the mission. But yeah, it is really nice when you mix together because you have the kill points, you have the objectives, you have the movement missions. And I do think the more we can mix them going forward, I hope V3 has some nice missions in the rule book where you have sort of the, the objectives plus movement or the objectives plus the kill points like what you've done here. Because I think it does add a really nice little dynamic to the game that otherwise doesn't really exist. Exactly. I agree. I, I'm looking forward to the missions in version three wholeheartedly whenever whenever it comes. Um, and I also, I have been asked, mm -hmm. what I, why are you putting this out now? Mm -hmm. Isn't version three around the corner? Well, Warlord Open Day just happened. They didn't announce it. No, they didn't. No. It's around a corner, just mm -hmm. not this it's corner. It's necessarily the next corner. <laughs> this yeah. corner, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't know when it's coming out. I honestly have no idea. I put this out, and if... For some reason, version three drops tomorrow. Um, guess what? We're going to go back to the, the drawing board and we will address these missions using the V3 rules. We'll probably play some games with them and then we will put them out again. Um, you'll have to remember the 2016 pack, which became the 2020 pack, was written for version one. And if you read it carefully, there's a couple of wording issues or not even issues, um, wording style. Yeah, style, turns of phrase that are used in the 2020 pack that was from version one, that if you marry it up to version two's missions, they're different. And it wasn't until one of the Moab players last year pointed it out, <laughs> Aaron, I'm talking about you, that I went, you are, he was literally the first person who ever caught me, yeah. you know, using V1 wording mm. in a V2 mission. But, you know, bolt action's universal. Yeah. And when version three happens, whenever it happens, I'm sure, you know, something will have to be changed and we'll have a 2023 part two pack yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. or something else. It'll be fine. Yeah. I don't see the game changing to the extent that missions are completely broken. Uh, like if we look at the difference between V1 and V2, as you say, those missions seemed absolutely fine for a long time. And it took a long time before someone noticed a wording difference. Mm -hmm. And so I don't. So I think really anyone who is worried about V3 I imagine it's not going to be su sufficiently different that it's going to ruin any of your current missions that you've got on the back burner. 
Phil, what else were we going to ask about? Yeah, I think it'd be interesting to, because I, I listen to the um, HMG podcast or watch it on YouTube, and it'll be interesting to hear what the differences are between the scene in Australia and the UK in terms of, I don't, I hate the word meta, but you know, in terms of the kind of thing that, that people are bringing, because there is definitely a difference um, around the world. And we're, we're both going to the World Open War Tournament next month, which is in the, mm-hmm. in the UK that um, Russell Wright's running. Um now the HMG guys were going, then they're, they're no longer coming over. But there are, there will be European teams. I think the American, it's an American team coming over. So it'd be really interesting for us to be seeing what it's like around the world in, t- in terms of the local scene, all coming together in an international event. And then you obviously you got WTC next February that will be out as well, which will be even you know even more interesting and different, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Australia, for those who are not familiar, um, is scarily big. Um, We are a massive country and a very small people. Um, If you consider that we are the size of the continental United States-ish, I think we're slightly slightly larger. And then you factor in that there's about as, well, as many people living in the entire country of Australia as there are in the city of Tokyo, 23-ish million, 22 million people. Fun fact. We are spread all over the place. Um, Each state has a capital city and, you know, state and territory. So, you know, there's only seven or eight of these. Um, And so everything kind of in between is coastal towns and Mad Max. (laughs) And I mean, there's a lot of desert out there, ladies and gentlemen. And so when you start comparing metas or scenes and what they are like, there is a distinct flavor between each region that some other countries, you, you get more of a blend. Like in the UK, you have more of a blend between you know, different parts of the United Kingdom. Whereas we are very segmented and we only get together typically for big events. CanCon in particular is the big show. But even then, that shows my bias as being on the East Coast of Australia. Perth is really far away. It's the difference between like Boston and Los Angeles, maybe Boston and San Francisco, you know, wildly different. And Gorshin from the HMG podcast came over to Melbourne for um, PAX God, last year. And we play tested one of these missions and um, we played a game and I listened to the HMG podcast. I'm a big fan I particularly enjoy their show because they look at the game totally differently and they they even refer to the game as different. So (laughs) Gorshin messaged to say, hey, do you want to play a game of Bolt? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, man. (laughs) Oh, Bolt action. Yeah, cool. Let's do it. But just the way like they think about transports, the way they consider media machine guns, um, you know, how the their basic core of like, oh, you have to take big squads so you can get the leadership bonus. Whereas I'm like, wait, what? Huh? And I'm not saying that they don't know what they're talking about. They are very accomplished players. Playing Gorshin was <laughs> very challenging. I think we drew. Um, and that was by the skin of my teeth. You know, they know how to play the game. They just play it differently. And that is a night and day difference, I think, as far as philosophy within the game, which is fascinating. Um, whereas, you know, Sydney and Canberra and Melbourne, you can drive, you know, it's like an eight hour drive from here to, to Canberra, maybe a nine hour drive to Sydney. That's doable. Um, and so people, there's more cross pollination between events. The last time I ran an event, I had two players fly down from Canberra. So, you know, there's a little bit of cross pollination there. So there's more similarities. I think Sydney tends to be slightly more, and I don't mean this to sound negative. I think they play slightly harder version of the game. Mm -hmm. They tend to have fewer restrictions um, and they tend to play lists that are a little harder. Um, Whereas, um, you know, there's definitely camps within Melbourne that want to play hard and other camps within Melbourne that want to play, you know, super soft. Mm -hmm. And I think the middle ground uh, and I know that exists in Sydney and Canberra as well, but I think that middle ground, the needle tracks a little bit harder in Sydney than it does in Melbourne. Mm-hmm. And then Canberra, I think, is in between. 
And so you you get this when people get together, you need to be very clear about the intent of the event mm. so that people know how to list for it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Moab is very much bring the toys. Let's fight here. Let's get it on on the tabletop. Mm. But it is still within the Australian meta, which, you know, like most of the things you would see outside of Megatron 3000 in Scotland probably would be resubbed here. They would go, nah, no way, buddy. That's too aggressive. <laughs> Not on your life. I had a series of WTC lists turned in throughout the events I ran last year. And every single one of them was, we asked them to resubmit with something more appropriate for the event and the scene. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. We tend to be much softer in Australia, but in Australia's defense, I do want to say that that doesn't make us any less capable player. <laughs> yeah. If that makes yeah. sense. You're choosing Absolutely, to play yeah. softly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm going to quote, and I'm going back to the very maybe second episode of Bolt Action Radio. Going back to when Bolt Action version one just came out. I can think of one of the very first episodes they put out. Judson and Dano were talking, and they were talking about going to a local event in Virginia. And they were talking about a player who took a, na- a rock hard list, had a bunch of flamethrowers, had a bunch of chaffees. And this is like weeks after the Ye- Armies of the United States book came out. Mm-hmm. And they said, and I still remember this to this day, I, th- I believe it was Judson um, said to Dano, yeah, good for you. <laughs> Golf clap, slow clap. Yeah. Good for you. You figured out how to break a game that is yeah. a lot of fun and easy to break. Like bolt action has never been the most balanced game ever. Yeah, yeah. It is still my favorite game, Yeah, but it is easily broken. And so for me, I'd rather have fun exploring new and interesting and different units mm-hmm. and different army, you know, army types and tactics than Taking this, everyone taking an M3 mm. and everyone, you know, the, the Stuart with all the machine guns on yeah. it. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, yeah. A thousand, a thousand national rules stapled onto a British army because they can <laughs> and no one else can. Like, I guess, yawn. Oh, good for you. And I'm sorry, Johnny, I'm not throwing rocks here. <laughs> Um, good for you. You have a bunch of dodges with flamethrowers. Like, golf slow clap. You figured it out. Sorry, Johnny. That's all right. <laughs> uh, no, please carry on, Brad. Carry on. I love you. Sorry. In my defense, I do think the flamethrowers are not the way forward at the minute. If anyone who is thinking about trying to break the game, don't go with flamethrowers would be my advice. Stick with your M3s and you go, because <laughs> if you do want a slow clap from Brad... Paragurkas, M3 Stewards, that's your way to go. Who, who would do that, Johnny, honestly? Indeed. It, hold on. At least in Paragurkas, you know, I am on record saying when that first came out, Paragurkas, you're at least paying for the national rules. Ish. You're undercosted. <laughs> so, Ish. So. They're still undercosted. Massively undercosted. But they're more appropriately yeah. costed than some of the other things. They're 16 points with an SMG, so it's the same as a normal vet with an SMG. But you get some you get some bonus bits for free. Which is insane. Yeah. And that's why they're just insane. For anyone who does want that slow hand clap, that's why. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, it's funny you're saying the sort of the broad church to quote Mark from mm. the Sounds of Battle podcast, because I think that's one of the great perks of England and sort of Britain more broadly, where we have the players who want to play very competitively and sort of tournament level. Yeah, yeah. We have the players who want to play very thematically. And because we're not a huge country geographically, like you can drive one end to the other in less than a day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You can go to all these different tournaments and we have a wealth of tournaments. So we have like the national tournament scene. So your English, Welsh, Scottish nationals, if you really just want to play as competitively as possible, that's for you. We've got the English Open, the Welsh Open, if you want to play sort of thematically. And Megatron will be mm-hmm. the same. Megatron's, Megatron's very similar, yeah, where it's sort of theatrical play. And so just by its very nature of playing theatres, you can't, it's slightly more difficult to break the game in that way because you can't just take that one unit that's undercosted and spam it. I think that's a real perk of England. And actually, it's when we talk about meta, it's so easy to sort of just tar everyone with the same brush, isn't it? But mm. actually, there's so many different ways to play the game that I don't think one is right and one is wrong. Exactly. But we certainly, we all have very strong opinions, I imagine. Mm-hmm. 
But that's the thing. As long as tournament organizers or event organizers, um, even the word tournament became a dirty word for a long mm-hmm. time. Like you mm-hmm. couldn't say the word tournament here. Um, you had to say event, even event organizers. I mean, as long as they are clear with their intent, this is the intention of this event. If you are coming to this, you know, these are the expectations. I think that is more important in bolt action than any other game. Yeah. Because it is the game is sort of there are some units that are just better uh, than others for their points. It's an efficiency thing. Yeah. And I'm really hoping we see a proper repointing in version three. And, you know, God willing, that happens. The game will be you know, new and interesting and wild again, because we're still using the same point values from V1, basically. Version Bolt Action Radio did. Yeah. yeah. I think on that sort of TOs being very explicit, the restrictions, I would strongly encourage TOs to think about adding restrictions that aid their theme. So if they are going very competitive, yeah. sort of limiting platoons, but not units, and equally if you're going very thematic, think about the units you don't want to see and how you sort of discourage them either by limiting to certain selectors like the Welsh Open do or a lot of other Opens do sort of like limited flamethrowers, limited stewards, mm-hmm. limited Gurkhas. Because I think everyone has a different subjective view of what is good. Yes. And I think, and so I think if you have an objectively hard rule like two flamethrowers max, then no one can complain if you bring two flamethrowers. Exactly. Yeah. And then we don't have this sort of back and forth with sort of like, oh, but but it's it's within the rules. <laughs> And we've, we've talked about this over yeah. episodes that we've put out, plus ones that we've recorded that are coming up, where you know it's really important, like you said, Johnny, to make sure that the intention of the event, you know, call it a tournament, call it an event, whatever, is clear, that the TOs are clear, and you have to expect players to build within the, the restrictions of the pack, mm-hmm. you know, rather than blaming them for saying, well, you've brought a really, really hard list. It's like, but if you allowed me to, and it wasn't clear in the event pack that you were going for a very historical-themed list, I've built my list according to the pack. So I think it's it's very, very important for me. And um, we go into this in quite a lot of depth when we talk about the three units in an episode that's coming up soon. Um, spoilers. Spoilers, yeah, yeah, massive spoilers. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. the, the TO is clear. Um, or even if you're playing at the club and, you know, with your mates, that you you know what you're walking into. There's nothing worse than, than going to an event and you've brought your lovely thematic fluffy list and someone rocks up with, you know, gazillion flamethrowers or, um, you know, Neville Werfers or spamming M3 Stuarts, whatever it is. And... Well, you, you'll enjoy playing the game, but whether or not you'll enjoy playing those three particular games <laughs> it will be very different <laughs> over the course of that day. Mm-hmm. 100%. Amen to that. Uh, spoilers, Johnny is actually on uh, episode, I think, 199 of Cast Dice, which came out this week as well, ladies and gentlemen, um, where, we, where he helped me to list for uh, an upcoming Melbourne event. And after that conversation with Johnny, I started working on the player pack for Operation Bear, which is Melbourne's sort of one of Melbourne's big events every year. And um, going off of our conversation, Johnny, because we talked a lot in that episode about how the restrictions filtered um, the way that I was listing and the intent of the event, um, I have come up with a <laughs> fairly extensive list. Uh, and I'm going to try to cut it down. I don't want to be, you know, Captain No Fun, nor do I want to have Every single army looked the same. That is mm-hmm. not the intent. Um, but I also, you know, just to bring it back to the pack a little bit, the reason this pack exists and why it's coming out in 2023 is we are now at the point at the end of version two where everyone's talking about changing the game. Yeah. Everyone's talking about taking the best units. And all of a sudden, you know, it's it, harder lists are becoming normalized. And that is something that happened at the end of version one. And it's something that's happened in other game systems life cycles. And at the end of version one, we put out the 2016 pack and it was a way for people to enjoy the game without you know, necessarily having to change their armies or having to change the rules. And so again, that's why now at the end of version two, we're seeing you know, the Bolt Action Alliance 2023 mission pack. Very nice. And it's funny because... I think some people are very anti-restrictions. They want to just play the game exactly rules as written. And I am a bit of a champion for that in terms of the rule book. But actually, one of the things I love about war games is I love building the army and thinking, mm-hmm. what unit should I take? Should I take this or should I take this? And there's a thing they talk about in art often where it's like, 
restriction seems like a terrible thing for creativity, but actually when you're very restrictive, you have to be more creative. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so actually when you go to a tournament and they've gotten rid of the units that you were, where your auto includes, I actually still really enjoy building armies for that. And I'm still trying to build as strong an army as possible, but I'm having to sort of like reach into the back catalog for units that haven't seen the table for ages. And so sort of on that note of restrictions, I think there really should be sort of a mental shift for anyone who thinks restrictions are bad at tournaments mm. and they just want to play their usual. I would very much sort of encourage a mental shift and think like this is a really fun way to add the, the list building, to make the list building process just a little bit more interesting and sort of making you think outside the box a bit. 100%. It can be as simple as changing the points. Mm. So rather than it being 1,000 points or 1,250, it could, you know, 800, 850, 950, 1,100, whatever it is, something that you don't see very often, it stops you from taking that 1,000-point army that you've played, you know, tens or hundreds of times, stops you taking that off the shelf, submitting that list to the TO, and playing your normal game. Because you've got to make compromises if you're going sub-1,000 points, because you've got to drop some units, obviously. You go over a thousand points. Okay, it's not just a case of adding in another unit for whatever the, the points difference is, because it might completely throw the um, flavor and the synergy of your army out just by adding in that one, that you know, two hundred point army to make it into a twelve hundred point force, for example. It's funny you say that because we do that in every Melbourne event. Okay, it's always a weird one. I think the last couple have been nine hundred and eleven. I think we had <laughs> one thousand twenty one. <laughs> not even rounding up no, to a nice man. number, you know, yeah. just. Totally random, three digits. That's it. There's a reason, and I actually, I, I can tell you right now, Operation Bear, which will be happening happening October 29th, is going to be another one of those fun totals, and I'm not going to tell you what it is until the player pack drops. <laughs> but I assure you, I'm going to get a series of rude hand gestures from players all over by going. You're going to make us figure this out again and go, yep, I don't want the army you played last time. We don't want the army you played before that. We want something different. Do something different. Nice. Add yeah, a yeah. couple of things here. Take away a thing there. Do something. And where can you get a ticket for Operation Bear if you are in the area and interested in playing in it? Uh, if you go to the Cast Dice Facebook page, you will find the player pack. Um, if you also search up Operation Bear 2023 in the events page on Facebook for Melbourne, you will find it there. Um, however, it is not out yet. The player pack is at least a week out. The co-TO, uh, Lee Avery, uh, the lovely and talented Lee Avery, who is the much better looking <laughs> half of our tournament organizing crew, um is currently <laughs> traveling so um we will have that for you shortly however um sponsorship is already locked in the, the venue is locked in and i'm hoping to start selling tickets in the next week Brilliant. but uh, there may be a player pack delay of a week or two but we will give you point values and some of the basic philosophies of the event before we sell tickets because that is important absolutely what is the venue is it a game store that you're running it at? It is. It's House of War. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the venues that we used for events pre-COVID um, went out of business. And House of War has been around for quite a while, but it is fairly far outside of the city uh, in a place called Ringwood. And it's about, what, 40 minutes by train, 30 minutes driving. Um, so it's very doable. Oh, yeah. You know, it used we used to run events literally in the center of Melbourne. And so it was easy I, I literally had a trolley and brought boxes from my apartment <laughs> to the venue and then back. Uh, but now, no, we uh, we rent a van and drive all the boxes to Ringwood and um, set everything up. But um, House of War is massive. Uh, and they have, oh God, they have <laughs> so much really weird and wonderful things. They have a life-size Dungeons and Dragons Beholder. <laughs> that talks wow. when you walk by it. It's automated. It lights up. It talks to you. And when you walk up the stairs to the venue, it it talks to you and you just go, I was not expecting that in a game store today. Um, <laughs> they have a pro-painted original Thunderhawk gunship that they paid a lot for. In the case by the door, um, they have the... And for 40K fans out there, if you've been watching terrain building on YouTube, the Titan graveyard board where it's a bunch of dead Titans, um, they have that permanently up in the shop. There's just a lot of incredible things in that store that 
just make it a really special and fun venue um, that no other game store I've ever been to is like. So uh, I I like going out there and I like playing uh, in games there. And so I'm looking forward to running another event with them. Not to mention they really like the bolt action crowd and the community. And they're always super generous with how they help us out and to make sure that, you know, the players have a really positive experience. So, yeah, yeah, that's um, really interesting. Funnily, I am actually aware of that store because I'm aware of that gunship. Mm. When we were at the Warlord Open Day, which I talked about on mm-hmm. your cast, um, we haven't talked about it on our podcast yet so this is a little bit of a um mm-hmm. nice little look behind the curtain there so we went to the warlord open day and they showed us the metal <laughs> casting process and phil and i were actually talking about the gunship model because the original thunderhawk gunship was all in metal mm-hmm. i believe and and we were saying just how heavy that model must be and yeah we were talking about that exact gunship because i'd seen on youtube i think it was squid mom and it just painted it up and then sold it to mm-hmm. the store and they've got it on display so if I was in the area, I would probably go to the tournament just to go and see that model because I don't think I've ever seen the original Thunderhawk in the flesh. Oh, haven't before. you? My my roommate, it when I worked at Games Workshop, um, had a Golden Demon winning one in our living room. Wow! Oh, wow. So that model <laughs> come. What, you're right. It's all metal. It weighs six tons. Yeah. And the only way that they could package it to sell it was to sell it in a wooden box <laughs> because cardboard literally wouldn't <laughs> hold the damn thing. And so yeah. you literally got a wooden box with, I believe it's got an Aquila on the front and then it you get a certificate. And yeah, it's those things are, mm-hmm. they are special. Mm. Yeah, it is a beautiful model. The one that House of War has is truly a piece of art. Brilliant. So, Brad, is there anything from the missions and the, and the feedback you've had from the missions that you want to share with the listeners? Yeah, I look, there's a couple of funny little quirky fun bits. Um, one of the missions on the fun side was never originally supposed to be in the pack. It was um, Lee Avery is a friend. He's the co-TO that I run uh, Operation Bear with every year. Uh, he's also a very close neighbor. And he and I played a Star Wars bolt action. Uh, last year, um, and we played a mission that I titled Utini, um, and it was there was five Jawas spread across the center of the table, and every turn they would move randomly, and then you had to collect the Jawas and hold on to them and not have your opponent take them from you. <laughs> and we were, you know, we played Star Wars bolt action that like stormtroopers had veteran durability but they had the minus one to hit of inexperienced (laughs) right um and um the the rebels were just regular but we lined up we were using my painted star wars legion armies but using bolt action rules and um yeah we had such fun playing that mission that i went you know what that's not fair and symmetrical but because we played that that became the the idea of what if we added fun missions to this too mm. and that mission became um extract the a- assets which at one point was called espionage was another one with like spies um uh, we we're jokingly calling it spies like us at one point it is <laughs> um it is the idea that you have five moving objectives evenly spaced across the front of the board and then they every turn they they move d6 inches that one again uh, pennies from heaven and uh, extract the in, uh, assets are not necessarily fair because things can move around into different areas of the board and it can advantage one player more than the other one which is not the intent of the pack but if you're playing a, a casual game or you're at club and you want to have some fun i i recommend those two missions those two missions also, because they do take a little extra time with the dropping the pennies and moving the Jawa, so to speak, um, they, they can take a little extra time. So I don't recommend mm-hmm. those for timed event play. But if you're a club, man, yeah, sure. I, I play extract the, ass, the assets. I, I cannot recommend that one enough. I think it is so much fun. I adore that mission. Yeah, I looked at that one and I, what I thought was it's, a little bit like what Manhunt probably should have been. Mm. Because it's it's very similar sort of idea. You're going to try and capture something, but you're not as restricted in how you capture it. And you've got that interesting movement. I actually don't think it's that unbalanced either. 
And my thought on it was the time element would be the reason why I wouldn't include yeah. it. But actually, there's nothing to stop you rushing up before they wander off. <laughs> yeah. And then they're in the middle still. One note on that, actually, question rules wise. Yeah. It doesn't, if it goes to a building or impassable, you move it less so that it doesn't end up inside of it. Correct. But I didn't, I don't think I saw in the pack anything about moving off the table. So if the end ones sort of wander off the table, would you recommend that players leave them at the table edge or allow them to wander off and you were just too slow getting there? <laughs> oh, that's vicious. You're a bad man, Johnny. Um, <laughs> I, I like that idea. Um, in the original notes, they're supposed to stop on the table edge. And I think yeah. you're right. They may not in this write-up. So um, look, I leave that up to you as the player. And But look, to be honest, the original intent was to have the missions stop. Sorry, have the objective stop on the edge of the table. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can, I, can I talk about a happy accident? Yeah, go 100%, ahead. Yeah. So if we talk about window of opportunity... Window of Opportunity is written to have four objectives on the table. And there's a bonus point if you can get a non-vehicle unit into your opponent's deployment zone. Now, between the original write-up of that and final publication, one word changed. And I promise you, I did it. (laughs) I'm not blaming anyone else. This is me. I uh, ADHD boy, 100% did this. It It said originally... Objectives cannot be placed within 12 of each other. However, if you read the mission, it says units or sorry, objectives can be placed. Yep. Mm. I did notice yep. that. Yeah. So I actually left that in. Nice. Because if people are playing it as I intended it when I wrote it, they will have spread it out. They'll have four objectives and then they will be putting, trying to get a unit into their opponent's deployment zone. So it's a combination of objective grab and what you guys call a movement mission. But one of the feedback pieces I got from these missions is you have too many goddamn objectives. <laughs> and a lot of people say, Can you please have fewer objectives. So this mission by accident allows you to do that. Because you can castle two of your objectives in one place. Yeah. And your opponent can castle two of them in one place. And so all of a sudden, you have three objectives, not four, sorry, not five. And that, you know, reduces the number of objectives on the board and allows people to choose the way they play that mission. I would recommend not placing things within 12, but if you want to, you can. Yeah. And I'd like that little, and this is one of the things actually with the setup, one of the things people say, because I like the I set up, you set up mode because it's fast. But one of the criticisms that people do raise is they enjoy sort of the tactical, Mm. so I'm going to put one unit here and then you're going to have to think about that and then I'll put one here. And that being part of the tactical layout of the game and objectives 100% are. And when I was reading this one, I was thinking about that, that you could just absolutely load one corner of the table Mm -hmm. if you are so inclined. Uh, But equally, you don't have to. And I think that is where a game is really fun, where you have that agency to, you can play it however you want. And equally, there's a tactical game there where you're having to respond to what your opponent's doing. Are they castling or are they going wide? How are you going to place your next objective once you see what they're planning to do? Yeah, I, I, I'm I, tempted. I have an evil streak in me. Like, <laughs> I, I played aggressively. I, I say this as a point not of pride or not to brag. I say <laughs> this so people understand. When I say I don't necessarily play competitive now, I played competitive 40K. I traveled across Australia well, extensively to become, to have the ranking points to be the number one rated player in Australasia at one point for a year and a half. Like I played hardcore 40K. I won a lot of events. I was fairly merciless with it. And (laughs) I have an evil streak that I I sit on and I really hold a a pot lid over because I don't enjoy that when I play bolt action. I, I don't want that to be in this game. And why I bring that up is the evil in me when I read that (laughs) typo and went, yeah, it's fine. Let's do this. And then I went to take a shower. And while I was showering, that little evil voice in the back of my head said, if my opponent castles and I, I'm going to orchestrate this. So I will put down the last objective if I can. And if that's possible, and if they castle, I'm going to put my third objective or my last objective 
in the middle of theirs and I'm going to ram my army down their throat mm-hmm. and I'm going to take those three objectives. <laughs> and you go, hmm, there's yeah. something to this. So yeah, <laughs> that's just a little thought. Um, <laughs> pincer movement is one that I've had a lot of people asking me about Yeah, um, because your defender deploys, if you think about the long table sides, the defender sets up in the middle of the long table side and it's within, I think it's 18 inches of that point. And that actually gains them an objective right off the bat in their deployment zone. And there's another two that run up straight down the middle of the board. And then Johnny, as you said earlier, in the corners, the attacker deploys um, their army 18 inches from either corner. And so if you add up the two on the sides, it equals to the same amount of area on the table as the defender. Mm-hmm. It's just split in half. Mm-hmm. Um, and when I was initially playtesting that, I was concerned that the defender would have an, a, an advantage because they would already have one objective and they would be right on top of the middle one. Yeah. You know, they're only a few inches away. That's why I was asking about this one earlier, because it's I had that exact thought that because they're starting with one, they'll have an advantage. There's no prep. So why would I want to be the attacker? But have you found in playtesting, it is fairly balanced. Yeah. Uh, I, that was one of the ones that I actually, the numbers were initially different as far as how far people would deploy. And that ended up being the the real point of, because it was like 12 inches, then it was 15, then it was 24, then it was 15, then 18. So it's moved <laughs> around a lot. But if you read the way it plays, reserves come in on the long table side. So if you're the defender and you have, have half of your army set there and you're sitting on that middle bit and you're pushing forward to get all those objectives early on, the attacker is going to run their units into your face. Meanwhile, you're getting pincered from the sides. It is a really uncomfortable situation to be (laughs) in. And I've been on both sides of that game. And that mission balanced itself out much better than I ever thought would be possible. Um, it, the defender does have a harder time yeah. and I, by having one of those objectives, I really do again, think that's the balancing point of that mission. Um, but I know that mission is a little bit controversial, yeah. um, in that particular way. I have a, a rules question actually about the intention of a rule, but also sort of the rules as written because, and it's not unique to this one, but it does feature in this one. You can deploy up to half of your force. Mm-hmm. Now, rules is written. That means I could deploy nothing. Correct. And so the question is, yeah, was that intentional that as the attacker, or I think the defender also is up to half, but as a player, yes. I could choose not to deploy and just play the game from turn two effectively. I have done that. Yeah. Um, that was one of the things I tested in, may have been that one. I'll, I think most of these missions have that mechanic. Mm-hmm. Um, and for a little while, when I played Bolt Action, when we were playing a lot as the LRDG, because some of the original V1 and V2 missions have that mechanic as well, mm-hmm. I would often say, cool, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> and then my opponent would be like, I'm sorry, what? And be like, yep, yeah, nope, cool, do your thing. And now, and then on turn two, I pile in. Now you might say, but isn't that bad? Because, you know, your opponent has time to dig in and get where you need to go and you have to roll reserves and that's minus one. Yeah, I get it. But my entire army is now coming on and I can now choose where I'm attacking. And I, like Johnny, like to play fast armies Mm. and a lot of my armies are very fast. And so either I will set up in a way that I can refuse flank someone, be in one place, have them deploy in a certain manner and then move away from them and then choose a part of their army to take a part, mm-hmm. or I won't even be on the board at all. <laughs> Bye. Um, and then I come in and hit them, you know, at, at the point of my choosing, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So, too. yeah. Yeah. That's how I like to play as well. Let you set up, and then I'll just react to that and just rush across the board to where I want to play the game. <laughs> mm-hmm. Highly recommend. Um, yeah, I, I played a lot of Dark Elder as a show. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Hey, there you go. The old- I used to have a witch cult. Yeah. Yes! Um, witch cult for the win. Yeah, all the raiders, and then you just rush at them and just, we'll hash it out in close quarters. That's it. And you have the invulnerable in close combat. That's how you do it. Yes. 
Yeah, was there anything else you want to discuss? Um, well, I think that's largely again, it's six I think it's just six missions. They're fair and fun, um, symmetrical, they're designed to be fair and timely for event play. And then three additional ones that could be easily used in events if you wanted to, but they are more intended to be played in more of a club setting or, you know, uh, over a dining room table. But equally, all of these missions um, are there to be fun. And I like to think that there's multiple ways that these can be fought and played. So the replayability is there. Uh, particularly if you're facing different types of opponents. Um, and I, I, again, would just like to take, take a split second to thank, I mean, Brian Cook in particular for doing the layout of these. I wrote the words. He made them as beautiful as they are. And he laid out the maps and did everything. The man is truly a legend. Um, and equally, I would like to thank Seamus Hamron of... Uh, Chicago fame of the Bolt Action Alliance and the Ghost Army podcast because he did the incredibly hard yards of editing and revising my English to make sure that it <laughs> actually made sense. Um, the man is also truly a legend, um, a, a, a walking, talking grizzly bear, um, if you've ever seen his avatar online. Um, but yeah, between the two of them, um, this pack would not be possible without them. Um, equally, this pack would not have happened if it wasn't for all of the people literally around the world who contributed their thoughts and their feedback in turning in, into what it is today. And for example, if window of opportunity is played in a bunch of events and people think, you know what, that thing where you can deploy objectives on top of each <laughs> other, Screw you. Let's get rid of that. Um, I mean, that that mission is the only mission in the pack that doesn't say a unit cannot hold one or has to hold or can only hold one objective. Sorry, that's what I'm trying to say. If people hate that, if people want that mission to change, if they think, you know what? This mission's better with the 12-inch push. We will change it back. Again, we want uh, we want people to play them, though. Um, it's one thing to look at them and to say, yeah, you know what? I don't like this, but give it a go. I personally thought pincer movement didn't work and I wrote it <laughs> until we played it. And then the more we played it, the more I like it. And now it's one of my favorites. It's the, it's the redheaded stepchild. Is that the, <laughs> that's not the right way of saying that. Sorry. Um, it's, it's the favorite redheaded stepchild. It's the Pippi Longstocking of, uh, of, of these missions, but it's um, please, ladies and gentlemen, if you are listening to this, I hope you do take the time to check out the bolt action Alliance 2023 mission pack. You can find it. If you type it into Google, you will find it. Likewise, you can go to the bolt action Alliance on Facebook and search us out there. Um, it, the pack is posted there or a link to. Um, if you play this in an event, if you play this on your dining room table, if you play this, any of these missions at a club, if you have feedback, even if it's to say, you know what? I like the way it, it's written. Please send that in. Um, so often with these things, it can, we can sometimes get lopsided feedback. And it is really important that we get the good and the bad but please, please, please don't give us feedback until you get boots on the table, because that's where it counts. Indeed, yeah. And we, we do really want it. And I do keep literally every word of feedback that is turned in. And every one of those bits of feedback is considered. Many things are trialed before we put out the next pack. Uh, and I would anticipate that <clears throat> Brian Cook willing... <laughs> because he'll be the one to <clears throat> lay it back out again in a new exciting color that once version three hits, we will probably revisit the pack, possibly combine everything into one master pack and possibly add a couple of new scenarios that might match the per you know, match something of how version three works, depending on how the game evolves. If we don't have the feedback, we can't use that feedback. Now, yes, obviously, version two, version three, they're different. Um, theoretically, you know, knock on wood, will there'll be different versions of the game. 
And yes, we will have to weigh that into account when addressing feedback. But the difference between version one and version two, we were able to use every bit of feedback that we were given in the creation of these. And again, I, I can't thank tournament organizers enough and um, you know people who have just picked this up and decided to play some of these missions because they want to do something a little different with bo uh, Bolt Action. Thank you again for checking it out. And thank you for all the feedback, friends. We do love you and we appreciate you. And please keep sending them because uh, we'll keep doing it if you keep playing them. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us today to talk about all the new missions. And thank you for your regular podcast. It does fill the long painting hours when preparing for a tournament. So I do really appreciate having that to tune into on a weekly basis. So please do keep up the good work with the podcast. Thank you to all the listeners. And please do leave us a review if you're enjoying Tabletop Tommies and leave Brad a review if you're enjoying Cast Dice. Thank you, Brad, for joining. It's been great listening to the new Bot Action Alliance pack and also the, the background to it. Um, and thank you as well from me for the Cast Dice podcast. I, like Johnny said, I do enjoy listening to it. And it's nice to listen to something that isn't Bolt Action related, albeit when I am painting Bolt Action miniatures. But there we go. Thanks, everyone, to all the, the likes, shares, and subscribes. Please continue to do so. Uh, drop us a message via Facebook and leave us a review if you like the pod. Ta-ta for now. Ta-ta for now. Good night, y'all. Mm -hmm.